die, Father. There's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had a feeling that something is missing in me. I want to know why I'm here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. redicecreations.com and we have uh, much more for you right there on all the topics that we find interesting and important so I hope you check it out. Tom Horn is an internationally recognized lecturer, radio host and best-selling author of several books including Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here and the upcoming Exo Vaticana. He is a well-known columnist who has been interviewed by US congressmen and senators on his findings as well as featured repeatedly in the major media. Tom received the highest degree Honorary doctorate bestowed in 2007 from legendary professor Dr. I.D.E. Thomas for his research into ancient history. And today we're going to discuss the recent news of the abdication of Pope Benedict XVI and the prophecy of the final Pope, Peter the Roman, whose reign would end in the destruction of Rome. The list of the popes from St. Malachi heralds the beginning of great apostasy followed by great tribulation, setting the stage for the imminent unfolding of apocalyptic events. According to this prophecy, the next pope will be a false prophet who leads the world's religious communities into embracing a political leader known as Antichrist. We will also discuss the reformation of the Catholic Church and how whoever seats the throne of the papacy might take a more active part in both politics and the disclosure of extraterrestrial life, something Tom writes more about in the upcoming book, Exo Vaticana. All right, welcome back so soon, we should say, due to these uh, very interesting developments, of course. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time talking with us uh, today, Tom. Hey, Henrik, always great to be with you on Red Ice Radio. Excellent. Uh, I know how many requests you've gotten about this, understandably, so we're, we're very fortunate to have you uh, with us. We really appreciate it. So uh, tell us, first of all, Tom, what, what, is, what has happened and what do you know so far regarding the resignation of the, of the Pope, Tom? Well, of course, I, I think we knew... Uh, at least we speculated a lot. Uh, last year, 2005, when we released that book, Petrus Romanus, the final pope is here because, uh, and by the way, I should say that I don't consider myself to be a prophet. A lot of people now are saying that I am. I don't, I really don't see that at all. Um, all I think I am is an investigator and maybe I'm pretty good at analytical deductions because we saw evidence in 2012 that the pope was about to resign. And that, of course, uh, he is the final, he is the next to the final one on the ancient prophecy of the popes, which is ascribed to St. Malachi, which we can talk about if you like to. And I came on your show last year, and we talked about that and how it was our feeling that the pope was going to resign in 2012. And in fact, I might have said this on your show, we certainly said it in the book, that we speculated he was going to resign in March or April of 2012. Yeah. Now, we were led to believe that that didn't happen, and uh, here just on Monday, uh, this last week, so we're only talking, what, five days ago or something, uh, six days ago, seven days ago, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been doing so much radio, I don't know what day it is. No, no worries, Tom. <laughs> but, but basically a week ago, uh, the Pope 
announced that he was going to abdicate uh, his uh, bishopry over Rome and, and his uh, sitting upon the throne of Peter. And uh, now, why that brought a great deal of attention back upon me was three weeks before the Pope announced that he was going to resign, I was on another radio show with Steve Quayle in which I said that the resignation of Pope Benedict was imminent. Well, then three weeks later he resigned, and everybody in the world wanted to know how I knew that. Right. Right? Mm. Um, an interesting thing, though, uh, that we have since learned is that, in fact, the Pope actually stepped down in 2012 exactly when we speculated that he was going to. And this was verified in a February 11 article in the New York Times. The title of that article, if somebody wants to look it up, is called A Statement Rocks Rome, Then Sends Shockwaves Around the World. This was right on the heels of the Pope turning in his resignation. And if you read that article, you see where the editor of the Vatican-owned newspaper, the El Observatore Romano, a man by the name of Giovanni Maria Vian, he confirmed that the Pope had actually handed in his resignation at the, exa at the exact time that we predicted he would, March 2012, and the New York Times quotes the Vatican spokesman saying, quote, the Pope's decision was taken months ago after his trip to Mexico and Cuba in March 2012, yes. and it has <laughs> been kept with a reserve that no one could violate. Well, boy, they really kept a lid on that because even most of the cardinals were unaware that he had officially turned in his resignation, and maybe the bigger or deeper mystery is why he turned it in last year. Uh, and by the way, when somebody says, well, how did you deduce down to March or April of last year? Mm -hmm. That actually had a lot to do with the French Codex by René Thibault that I talked with you about a year ago. People could listen to that archive show uh, in which we went through some of the speculation about René Thibault. And he's the one that actually had brought it right down to March and April. So based on a lot of other deductions and then using the Jesuit code breaker for Rome, who over 60 years ago said that the uh, that he didn't name Benedict, but he said that the Pope before Petrus Romanus would resign around March or April of 2012. So he absolutely nailed it on the head. Now this raises just a huge amount of questions about the prophecy of the popes, whether the prophecy of the popes was supernaturally inspired, either you know divinely or demonically. I'll let other people determine what <laughs> they think about that, right? Yeah. But it was supernaturally inspired, or maybe the deeper question is, there are those inside the Vatican who hold this prophecy to some esteem, and the College of Cardinals have been using it like a road map to, uh, to vote for, to elect, popes who somehow can be seen as fulfilling that prophecy, and, and maybe there was some what? Was there some pressure? Was there some opus dei manipulating uh -huh. going on behind the scenes in Rome that put pressure on uh, uh, Benedict to step down at that exact moment because that's the way the prophecy had speculated it? It just raises a huge number, probably more questions than answers. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's very interesting, very strange as well. Now, I have to ask you, Tom, uh, does all of this then have something to do with the the trip to Mexico in March 2012? There came out some articles that he he fell, he hit his head in some way, and this is like what's what has led to all of this. Do do you agree with that? Have you read that? Well, he was injured. Now, did he fall? Um, was he attacked? Uh, I you know just who in the world knows? Uh, but he was injured, uh, according to the official stories. He woke up the next day, had blood on his head. By the way, today's news is reporting that he's gone blind in one eye. Really? Um, oh. Yeah. And furthermore, uh, we've known for some time that, and this, this played into our speculations about why and when he would retire, uh, that his health uh, wasn't doing that well. He, he was getting weaker and weaker. He's being wheeled around on a cart at some of the places where he went to speak. He himself, don't forget, uh, in an interview, had been asked whether it would ever be permissible for a pope to step down, or should they always die in office? And he had actually argued, and he's, he, you know, he used to be known as God's Rottweiler. He was a strong <laughs> theologian uh, for the church, great at arguing. And he had actually said that if if the pope, uh, you know, got to a point where he could no longer uh, carry out his duties as the pope, then it would be permissible under church rules and law for that pope to be able to step down so somebody else could do the job that could actually carry out the functions of the church. So he himself had argued that. That played into some of our deductions. And then his brother, who is a priest, 
uh, as well last year had been talking about how his uh, health was failing and that he felt he was putting pressure as a family member, a brother, uh, on Benedict to consider stepping down. So a lot of this doesn't really come as a surprise, the fact that he was weak, that he's aged, you know, he's 85, uh, that he slipped and fell and maybe fractured his skull or something. Um, it's all completely believable, but it still doesn't um, address how, over 60 years ago, Rene Thibault, how, how could he have known that you would have a pope who was going to get old and fall down and have to retire? The other thing, by the way, that's brought a lot of attention on us is that we uh, say in our book, Petrus Romanus, that this pope would not die in office, but in fact he would retire. Now, that was a bold statement since this hasn't happened uh, for 600 years. I mean, to put this in perspective, uh, you know, the, United, the U.S., uh, Europeans had not even come here and discovered this as a country. Mm. This was a very long time ago since the last pope actually retired uh, in office, but we predicted that he would. And three weeks before the pope stepped down, that's what I repeated, that he wouldn't die in office, that he was going to step down. And I had a very strong feeling about that. Now, of course, it brings us to the, you know, to the final part of that prophecy, and who is it that is going to uh, be elected into the role of Petrus Romanus and I don't know how long, you know, uh, when this show is going to play on air, but but we're within, you know, two to three weeks right now probably uh, of that decision being made, unless for some reason it gets drawn out. Yeah, this is going to go up in just a few days here. So basically, what we've what we've heard so far is that is officially going to resign on the twenty eighth of February. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and um, so he's given a little bit of headway here and leeway, if you will. Do you know now if if the procedure is going to be standard as as usual when a pope, uh, well, previously then has 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 died? The whole uh, all the cardinals are going to get together and 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 select and with the smoke and all the stuff that we know about. Is that what's going to happen next? Yeah, uh, that is what's going to happen next. And you know, it, to, in other to understand the rules around this right now. Uh, on the uh, the next day after his retirement is official. So if he goes through February 28th, and this is not a leap year, March 1, uh, Peter the Roman Bertoni, uh, who is his Carmelingo and the current Secretary of State, will then step into the official capacity of being um, the Pope in place of the Pope until a Pope can be elected. So it, if for no other reason than for at least a very short period of time, the prophecy is going to have a very uncanny sense about it, <laughs> that you have a, uh, uh, an Italian, he's a Roman, he was born in Romana Canaverse, uh, his name is Peter, so you, you have this uh, 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 a startling fulfillment of the prophecy, at least for a very short period of time, in um, uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Peter Roman, uh, Cardinal Peter Bertoni, excuse me, got too many names going through my head. <laughs> um, now, but uh, um, all of the uh, elector cardinals, and there's not supposed to be more than 120. I don't know how flexible they are on those rules, but let's say you know 120 electors, the College of Cardinals, they they will head now uh, to the Vatican. Uh, the, and there will be a whole process of sequestering the voting members uh, so that the outside world can't have contact uh, with them. Uh, any cardinal who's turned 80 before the day that the papacy was vacated, either by death or resignation, cannot take part in the uh, election. And that would mean that if Bertoni was elected, he's, I think, 78 now. That would just squeak in. I think there's reasons, by the way, I could give you who I think my top um, potential uh, uh, electees are. I think there's reasons why Bertoni at one time would have been a favorite and probably isn't now. I think um, Peter Turkson of Ghana yeah. uh, had a lot going for him. Uh, he's made some mistakes in the last week because he's said to the media, he has said publicly that he would be willing to take the position of the Pope if the Lord willed it. Well, that's a giant no-no. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the electors really frown on you being out there uh, where it appears maybe that you're candidating like an American president. They don't like that at all. So uh, <laughs> he may have shot himself in the head with those comments. Anyway, the, there has to be a two-thirds vote plus one majority. That's what's required to elect a pope. Uh, two ballots each are held in the morning and afternoon. Uh, if a new pope's not elected after 12 to 13 days, then they can choose to impose just a majority rule, so a simple majority. Uh, and I could explain the whole process, how they write down the votes. Uh, people wonder what, you know, what's up with the white smoke and the black smoke. 
That's because when they write down their uh, their votes, they fold the paper a certain way. Uh, they put that paper onto a certain uh, plate that's then spilled over into another plate on the top of an altar. Those are counted by what they call the scrutineers. Uh, and um, if, though, nobody gets the, um, the uh, uh, two-thirds plus one majority at the first part of the vote, they keep doing it. But in any case, if nobody's elected, there's a chemical that they put on those ballots, and they put them in the furnace, and when they're burned, uh, then that smoke uh, comes out, and it's black, and then they know that, you know, so far nobody's been elected. When the, when the smoke finally uh, turns, uh, um, you know, white, then they'll know that somebody has been elected. So there's a whole process around how they do this. It's very archaic, uh, but it's the way they still do it. And they're they're headed there now. Now the the, the rules normally would say that when a pope <coughs> uh, passes away, within two weeks, the College of Cardinals is supposed to um, come together to begin this whole process. That's the reason why. Uh, everybody at first was saying they're going to come to Rome March 15th because with the Pope resigning on the 28th, two weeks, basically those are the rules. But they can choose to come together sooner than that. And with the Pope resigning, they have a you know um, they have an early notice, uh, and that's why some media right now is saying they might come together even sooner than that and start the process earlier on in March. But right now we expect that from the middle to the end of March, certainly before Easter, they're hopeful that uh, we will have a new pope and the world will then know who Petrus Romanus of this 900-plus-year-old medieval prophecy, uh, who that personality is, and then, of course, wait with bated breath to see if the rest of the prophecies around him, the speculation around him, plays out. Now, I want to get into uh, more of the prophecy here, of course, and if you uh, have any new top electees, as you said, I remember we talked about Peter Turkson the last time and, and Bertoni and all these as well. But before we go there, uh, a few hours, I think, just after the Pope's resignation was announced, we had uh, lightning striking the Vatican. I mean, come on. I'm not saying that this is not an act of God, but are, are they playing with harp here? This is like theatrics, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Well, one of the things people are going to learn, I think in the second hour we're talking about our new investigation, which we were already working on, called Exo Vaticana. We've been working on it ever since we stopped Petros Romanus last year, uh, and now we're feverishly trying to get that investigation finished. Uh, We're hoping to have actual book in print by the time the conclave is in session, and we'll see. Um, I think the second book, it's actually bigger, it has more footnotes, and in, 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 in many ways is actually more shocking uh, than the first one. Uh, but as it heads to the typesetter, we don't know whether the last pope's going to turn out to be a person on our short list, but whoever he is, there's some intrigue surrounding how he might accommodate the newly celebrated astrotheology of Rome's top astronomers and theologians that we investigate in the second book. Um, but part of this has to do with signs from the heavens. We devote entire sections in this book to pointing out how the Bible describes the false prophet. Some people believe that Petrus Romanus, they, some people believe that the very next prophet or pope is going to be the false prophet of biblical fame. And I'm not just talking about evangelicals. There are Catholics who believe this, and there are there are Catholic academics who have written about it for a long time. So we go into all that. But here's the point. The false prophet and the Antichrist uh, in the Bible have allegiances and endowments that are not of this earth, including the fact that both of them can call fire down from out of the heavens, uh, which, of course, is suspected to be the host location of those uh, aliens. What The first thing that went through my mind when lightning uh, struck uh, February 11th uh, now, uh, now we're just talking. What is again? One week ago, this is very recent. Yeah. Struck St. Peter's Basilica twice immediately following the resignation of Pope Benedict. Th- this whole thing, the very first verse that went through my mind, had to do with how they have power to call fire down from out uh, of heaven. Hmm. Now, th- uh, uh, um, it was also two lightning bolts, which numer- you know numerically corresponds very well with the false prophet, uh, and the Antichrist. How so? Well, two, they both have the power to call fire down from out of heaven. Uh, 
And uh, so you have two lightning bolts, one yeah. after the other. Um, and there's, by the way, there is an ancient occultic, but also a biblical perspective around this. For instance, the scripture says, and the Lord, the Lord speaks once, yea, twice. Hmm. And in occultism and in uh, biblical scholarship, there is a precedent that says, you know, if the Lord wants to confirm something, he'll repeat it. And so lightning striking twice, uh, uh, and not just lightning striking somewhere in Rome, you know, hitting St. Peter, Peter's Absolutely Basilica, amazing, absolutely amazing. With, you know, which, uh, and then right there, you know, in the, in the near distance is the Roman obelisk that speaks to the coming of this final uh, figure that we believe to be uh, the Antichrist. There's just a great deal around this. And again, this isn't just Tom Horn. They're Catholics right now. Uh, one of the most highly visited Catholic websites is run by Michael Brown. Uh, I don't know if you've ever interviewed him. Uh, he runs Spirit Daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, not yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, he and I, have we've communicated uh, over the past, but just something like two, three days ago, he uh, had a headline that he wrote on Spirit Daily called When Lightning Strikes, Sometimes It Is Simple Energy in the Air, and Sometimes Perhaps Something Else. That's the title. <laughs> um, and he goes on to point uh, Catholics at the point to Catholics and to remind them how many apparitions of their faith and also omens, both auspices and inauspices, uh, have been uh, warnings to the faithful that have been accompanied by lightning. And he talks about the apparitions at Lourdes, uh, which, by the way, were also commemorated last Monday, the day the Pope uh, uh, made his announcement. But he points to that and reminds Catholics how apparitions were combined with thunder and lightning at Lourdes. Then he points uh, how it was a flash of lightning that, that introduced the first appearance of the apparitions at Fatima in 1917. And that's also something you and I talked about last year on your show, how that the true revelation of Fatima might have been being covered up, but might actually now come to pass with the election of the final pope. Um, uh, he, uh, he, uh, Spirit Daily also points to Metagori. Uh, the night before uh, Mary's first reported apparition, lightning struck with such force that it actually damaged the village post office and some other buildings, and villagers went running out into the streets to <laughs> sprinkle holy water on the ground. <laughs> it scared them so much. Uh, thunder and lightning on the mountains of La Salette in France uh, that herald the appearance of Mary. So this list goes on and on and on. There is a, there is, there is a significant... Um, uh, number of comparable facts that when um, something of significance was happening within the Roman Catholic Church, whether it was church-approved apparitions or now the retirement of Pope Benedict, all of a sudden you get this lightning, right, coming from out of the heavens. It's very strange. Now, is it harp? You know, there, there, there is, there is this. Um, uh, this other thought kind of rambling in the back of my mind. I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a woman by the name of Dr. Carol Rosen. Oh, sure, yep. And uh, she swore that before he died, Dr. Werner von Braun in the 70s, uh, she was working in an office with him, and uh, he shared with her how that there was going to be a, a fake alien invasion of planet Earth, and that this was all what was really behind the whole Star Wars project and all that, um, that, that would be used to set up a one-world uh, government, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it, if, if that's true, that there's going to be some kind of a fake invasion that then would bring the, the world to its knees in fear, that would then give rise to a one-world government because everybody's you know crying out for some kind of safe haven, uh, then... If that's true, if that technology is developed to that stage, uh, well, then, of course, it could have been HARP or something else that sent a lightning bolt down. But I take a more supernatural, metaphysical uh, approach to it in my own belief system. And I think, like uh, Michael at Spirit Daily, uh, I think something is a stir in the supernatural realm. And let me just give you a quote, by the way, uh, from his website that I have right here. Um, he, he's talking on and on and on about all this. He says, a pope's resigning for the first time in six centuries, a pope who took the name Benedict, as in the saint who battled evil. 
in a letter on the same day, February 11, 2013, naming a special envoy to a solemn celebration of the World Day of the Sick, Benedict included the term Mary, Mediatrix of all graces. Now listen to what he says about this. This is a title that was used very sparingly by pontiffs. It's only attached in the minds of many Catholic faithful with the potential declaration of a new dogma, Hmm. one that they feel could herald major events in the world, a dogma that up until now Benedict has long uh, resisted. It comes when astronomers expect to see a highly visible comet which may even appear during the conclave, announcing a new pope. Some believe the next pope will be the last in this particular era. Time will tell, end quote. So here you have a, you know, a very popular Catholic website, and his writer is uh, saying that this could be the last pope, the fulfillment of Petrus Romanus, and that this comet is a sign, uh, uh, and further, that a papal decree heralding a major change in dogma is coming. Well, I can tell you, though I can't yet let the cat out of the bag, uh, our book, Exo Vaticana, is about that very subject, a, a coming papal decree that is going to, well, let me just put it this way. It's not only going to say that belief in extraterrestrials is okay for Catholics, what it's really going to say is that denying the reality of extraterrestrials is akin to heresy uh, be because it limits God's creative ability. Interesting. And what the, what the Jesuits and members of Opus Dei have written in, in the form of official uh, church theology, brand new doctrinal papers that have been written, which we're publishing, I think is absolutely, Henrik, it's going to shock the world because... They evidently know something that the rest of us don't know that seems to be pointing to a very imminent uh, official disclosure moment that somehow, some way is going to need for the Vatican, the largest Christian organization in the world, to tell everybody that it's okay and these are our space brothers. And not only are they our space brothers, they're closer to God than we are and they've come to show us the way. <laughs> very interesting. I, I can't help to wonder as well how much of a political move all of this is. I mean, if we for a moment put the supernatural aspects to the side, which we, I mean, the, it, when we zoom out and look at the whole picture, we have to take everything into account, of course. But sure. uh, this is a uh, this is at a time now when there's been tremendous scandals around the Vatican and all the stuff with the uh, with, with the pedophilia and the protection of these priests and all, everything. And 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 I couldn't help to feel at the beginning, at least, that. Someone might be forcing, you know, Benedict off the off the stage, if you will, because they want to bring someone else onto the scene that can, uh, well, do a better cleanup job, if you will, Tom. In all of this, yeah, I think there's something to that. Again, that was all part of what we wrote in Petrus Romanus. Uh, in fact, we've had people this week and last week since the Pope resigned telling us that really the most tantalizing aspects of our investigation didn't have anything to do with the supernatural side of it. It was the side that where we were dealing with the Vatty Lakes and trying to interpret in a very just geopolitical atmosphere what that scandal, what was really going on behind the scenes. And we were trying to get some Vatican insiders, priests, trying to get them to talk to us. And we were having a very hard time. And, and mostly, I think, Henrik, because most of them didn't really know. You had to get yeah. way up the ladder. It was really among a small tribe of the real power brokers uh, inside uh, the Vatican. Uh, but the more we investigated it, at one time I did also hire a private investigator, and the more we invested it, investigated it, if you go back and look at articles that we published a, 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 a year ago now, we were publishing these in March, April, and May on Raiders News Update, and you'll see how we were already talking about uh, somebody leaking um, papal documents. That turned out to be Paola Gabriel, right? Yes. He got arrested by the magistrates as the source behind the leaked documents. The minute that happened, we said he's just he's just a figurehead. He's somebody who was being used, but he was being used by people much more powerful than he is. Then a Vatican computer expert was arrested, Claudio uh, Ciarpetti, uh, and he was convicted of aiding and abetting. And we said he's just another pawn. And then uh, one cardinal was suspected of operating behind the scenes. And anyway, the, we, what we've been saying from the beginning is that this was um, a much deeper internal power struggle. Well, now, you know, church historian Alberto Maloney, he's writing how that all of it was just a power struggle among cardinals in the Curia. 
uh, the Vatican Central Administration, a stratagem of tension, an orgy of vendettas. That's the kind of language <laughs> they're using, preemptive vendettas. And then there was an article talking about how uh, Bertoni was, was plotting, uh, what was the language they used, um, something like extraordinary counter move. So it was move, counter move. But really it comes down to two or three very powerful people in the Vatican who were jockeying to take the place of uh, Benedict, mm -hmm. whether they would look at that as I want to play the role of Petros Romanus, whether that part of it is true or not, didn't make any difference. They knew that Benedict's time, that his days were numbered, right? And they were jockeying for position, which included mudslinging against their main competitors. So you had people probably on the one side, uh, Sedano, people like that, who were also part of the uh, 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 Fatima cover-up who were using their political influence to try to, un, you know, to try to um, play off of some of these leaked documents to make Bertoni look bad. Bertoni, on the other hand, he's an Italian, probably has a lot of friends inside uh, the Vatican uh, that were trying to protect his uh, position as po uh, possibly, you know, the candidate that would take um, uh, Benedict's place. But right now. Some Vatican insiders are becoming more blunt. There have been news reports just in the last couple of days talking about since Benedict has stepped down, and now some of these people are becoming a little braver about this mutiny of the mom singers that's been playing out behind the scenes, <laughs> uh, jockeying for the role of the final pope. Uh, and th the bottom line is the unpleasant reality is that a conflict has been going on for probably 24 months, at least for 18 months, over who will become Petros Romanus, and it's been boiling beneath the surface, almost completely unknown to the public at large, but uh, foresaw, I think, by some of the Catholic prophets, and not just um, Malachi or Morgare, more recent Catholic prophets like Father Hermard, uh, Herman Bernard Kramer, who wrote about all this in the Book of Destiny, and talked about the final pope who would come and how there would be, it would be a time that would be accompanied by a lot of great negativity around Rome. And by the way, even some of the, old, the, the you know, some of the most oldest uh, Catholic prophets, Father Cardinal Manning, different ones, foresaw that Rome would eventually become so apostate that it would literally be destroyed. So are we, are we seeing that? Is that what we're seeing, that, that beneath the surface we're seeing the beginning of the end? Or is it all just politics around the pedophilia scandal? The Pope now, you know, uh, here's another thing we learned was that uh, when he resigned last year in March, April, secretly to just a handful of individuals, they started right at that moment taking, I think, what was uh, an old nun convent or something, but a building that was used by the nuns, um, and, but it's on the grounds of the Vatican, uh, and they started remodeling that into a, an apartment, a building where Pope Benedict is going to retire. They started doing that March, April of last year. Hmm. Uh, and were they at that time saying, in order to try to keep him from being prosecuted in an international court, which could then, as the Pope, represent Vatican, you know, at the Vatican at large, the Roman Catholic Church at large, which has just amazing levels of financial resources, uh, to stop that, he could retire, we'll force him to retire, and we're going to give him a little place to live on the Vatican grounds, which we can say we're our own nation state, and nobody can come here and arrest him. Right. So, yeah. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, well, definitely. Though. That's very interesting. And you mentioned financial resources, because I, I want to try to get a little closer to this on a geopolitical level uh we all wondering how much how much influence does the vatican really have how much does the pope individually even have because if if we look at at least the um the language of the vatican uh, as you said before they they are definitely kind of spearheading in some cases uh, you know the strive towards a, a a new world order a global government in some cases and how, so so how how important is it do you think for some of these people behind the scenes to become pope would that even be significant would that be uh can they influence a lot being that? Yeah, I mean, look, they, they don't politic like American presidents do or governors or whoever who go out and step up on a stomp and try to convince a bunch of voters of a particular thing. But they do politic. They they sit in their uh, lunch rooms and have, you know, wine and cigarettes and sit there and yak about who they think, uh, <laughs> you know, the next pope should be. 
and sadly, it, it probably doesn't have a whole lot to do with, with uh, the spiritual health of the church. It usually has more to do with who could political, politically favor the ideas of those particular cardinals. That's really what it comes down to. Who mm-hmm. could we put into office who could be a champion for our causes? Um, and so that's, that's another reason right now, when you think about uh, what's being said about uh, uh, Peter Turkson of Ghana, oh yeah, his name would be an amazing fulfillment since he is named Peter, and once he started ruling from Rome, he'd be Peter the Roman, Peter from Rome. Um, but how much political influence does Ghana have? I don't know, because I don't think there's a whole lot of Africans, cardinals in the, among the electors, but there is a majority Italian electors. And Rome is still an old boys club among the Italians. It just is. Sure. Uh, they, they went out on a limb, you know, recently. They, they elected a German. They've elected, uh, you know, other people. But I think this time around it's going to come back to Rome. I, that, my prediction would be that it's probably going to be an Italian. Now, uh, Cardinal Tarsicio Bertoni, um, he's the man most responsible for appointing a large block of Italian electing, elector cardinals last year that Benedict endorsed, but he's also angered and embarrassed a lot of non-Italian cardinals, so I think it's going to be hard uh, to get him uh, elected. A little side note, by the way, Cardinal Bertoni is a uh, a Cilician, uh, which means a disciple of uh, Don Bosco, the saint of the 1800s, who's famous for his vision about a future pope who arrives just as the Catholic Church goes through a fierce sociopolitical and, and spiritual storm mm-hmm. that some have interpreted as the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Just an interesting side note there about Bertoni, besides his name. Uh, of course, Cardinal Peter Turkson. Uh, there, uh, I think Cardinal Angelo Scola, uh, he's also an Italian. Uh, he's got a strong Italian block of voters, uh, and um, he works easily with them. I'm not sure to any extent that he's been involved in the you know the conspiratorial aspects of mudslinging, uh, he's got a theological background uh, that uh, issues from the church in Rome, uh, so that they think should be addressed. So I think he's a you know he's a possibility to keep in mind. There's another possibility that has the name of Peter, Cardinal Peter Erdo, and a lot, and nobody's talking about him. He's a Hungarian cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. He is the Archbishop in Budapest. Uh, he's the primate of Hungary. Uh, he's the president of the Council of the Bishops' Conferences of Europe, and he's only 61 years old. And if the cardinals this time around are looking for somebody who can stay in office for a while, uh, he could be a surprise, Peter the Roman. Uh, another possibility is Cardinal uh, Bakara Batros al-Rahi. He's 72 years of age, so he's young too, but Batros means Peter in Arabic. So there's some other possibilities there that could be a surprising win that people right now uh, are not talking about. Um, but uh, we're just going to have to wait and see. We did publish a top ten list. I think the Canadian um, uh, um, Coulet, I think he's a possibility. Um, but uh, so anyway, I, I think I lost what the question was. Oh, sure. No, 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 no worries, Tom. Very interesting. What, what is this? Let, let's get a little deeper into what do you think that this means then, potentially. I mean, let's say we, uh, anybody comes onto the scene here which has the name Peter, let's say, uh, becomes Peter Romanus, the last, the last pope. In, in your view, what do you think that we're in for? What does, what does this have in stock for us if, if one, even the prophecy is true or the, the you know, of the last pope? And does that mean like an, an era of, of the Antichrist ruling this planet, or what do we have to look forward to here? Well, you know, what both evangelicals and what some um, Catholic prophets have said for a long time is that when the final pope on the list of the prophecy of the popes, and don't forget that the prophecy of the popes itself says that this pope will serve the church during Great Tribulation, and then the city of Seven Hills will be destroyed. Yeah. Um, so it's talking about destruction. Well, this is a biblical theme, that, uh, that uh, the city on Seven Hills is the harlot, false religious enterprise, that uh, Babylon mystery religion, that will uh, be destroyed. The Zohar, I don't know if I ever talked with you about that. Oh, we There's have. A- we have. I remember it. But uh, relay it again for those who don't know. 
Well, and what's also interesting about the Zohar is that it was written 700 years ago. It was written a couple of hundred years after the prophecy of the popes. There's no historical connection anywhere whatsoever that any of the writers of the Zohar were even familiar with the prophecy of the popes, because don't forget, the prophecy of the popes was hidden inside the Vatican for uh, about 400 years. So it wasn't even public knowledge. But there's no, We have no uh, evidence whatsoever to suggest that um, the Jewish writers of the Kabbalah would have been familiar with it. Now that makes this extraordinary uh, because they also named the time frame 2012 to 2013. They named it. They put it. They wrote it down that this is when this was all going to happen and that Rome would be destroyed. And their language is almost identical to what is contained in the prophecy of the Pope. So now for people listening that don't know what I mean, there is um, contemporaneous to the arrival of the false prophet, if that's who Petrus Romanus is, and I'm not saying that the next pope will be the Antichrist or the false prophet. Sure, I'm yeah. saying that a lot of people believe that he will be, and they make that connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm saying he possibly could be, but I'm not saying he is. Got it? Uh, so in any case, um, but contemporaneous to the arrival of the false prophets and the Antichrist, there's this prophecy uh, that's in the Jewish Kabbalah, the Zohar. Uh, that's the most important collection uh, of Jewish mysticism was written in medieval Aramaic 700 years ago. It has, but in that book, it has commentary on, on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. But in addition to that, uh, it has a section called the Veera section. And this includes uh, a subsection called the Signs Heralding Mashiach, or the Coming of the Messiah. And what's fascinating about this is that they set the date for his appearance in the Zohar in 5773. And in the Jewish calendar, which is different than our Gregorian calendar, right? We say 2012, we mean January to December 2012. Their time frame is different. The Jewish calendar begins in the new moon of September in our calendar, 2012, but ends a year later in August of 2013. And here's what they said, 5773. So what is that? That's five months ago now? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, about five months ago now. Um, uh, they set the appearance. Now, here's what they say. Uh, and, and let me preface this by also saying that to Christians, uh, they would actually be talking about the coming of the Antichrist because the Orthodox Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So they were still predicting his coming. But, but, but uh, evangelicals and Catholics from the Bible would say they rejected uh, Jesus, but the Bible says that another will come in his name, that there will be an anti-Christ, a false Messiah who will appear. And for a period of time, uh, who some dispensationalists talk about a seven-year period of great tribulation, for a period of time, the, w- the world is going to accept him as the uh, Messiah. Um, now, okay, so let me read you what it says. Keep in mind, as I'm, as I'm reading this, the prophecy of the Zohar, given by Jews hundreds of years, separate from the divination of the last pope, um, they, they, so you have the prophecy of the last popes talking about who potentially could be the false prophet, where um, the prophecy in the Zohar talking about coming of the Antichrist, uh, but, it, but both of them talk about the reign of that period of time ending in the destruction of Rome. Uh, here's what the prophecy of the Pope says, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the terrible and fearsome judge will judge his people. But when you look in the Zohar, here's what it says. In the year 5773, the kings of the world will assemble in the great city of Rome. Now let me, let me stop here for just a second and insert this. The only time that we know that all of the, the representatives of the nations of the world, the kings of the earth, the only time they would send representatives to Rome from all over the world would be during a conclave. Yeah, exactly. I, I know of no other time where all of the most powerful nations on earth will be, would be sending their ambassadors or representatives to the Vatican than during a conclave. So let me go back to the prophecy. The kings of the world will assemble in the great city of Rome, and the Holy One will shower on them fire and hail and meteoric stones until they are destroyed with the exception of those who will not yet have arrived there, end quote. Hmm. So first of all, a 700-year-old uh, Jewish prophecy in the Zohar 
telling us that about the time the Messiah is going to appear, the, the nations of the world are going to gather in Rome, and the only ones of those representatives that aren't going to be destroyed when the city is destroyed uh, are those who were en route to get there and hadn't yet arrived. So this sounds like it's right at the very beginning of a conclave. People are assembling, they haven't got there. Uh, now, then it goes on to say, uh, these will commence, uh, excuse me, um, not all the kings will be destroyed. These will commence anew to make uh, war. But from that time, the Messiah will begin to declare himself. And around him, there will be gathered many nations and many hosts from the uttermost parts of the earth. In quote. So, they're, they're gathering in Rome. Something happens. Meteoric stones, fiery objects, as it's translated, uh, fall from the heavens to destroy the city. This leads to war. The the nations that are surviving or they're reacting to something, this is what's caused some Catholic mystics uh, to speculate that this is going to be a terrorist attack on the Vatican during conclave, because you've got these fiery objects falling, that then causes a response from powerful nations throughout the world, including probably the United States, re, uh, responding to that terrorist attack upon Rome. But this is going to be the catalyst according to this Jewish prophecy, that gives birth to the appearance of the Messiah, who we would call the Antichrist. So what's amazing is when you take this 900-year-old Catholic prophecy, this 700-year-old Jewish prophecy, and just combine it with evangelical and Christian eschatology, it's an amazing glove fit around some terrible event that then causes World War III, but which then also causes the formation of the most powerful nations of the world coming together under global government, which then could present this personality, the Antichrist and the false prophet, the leader of the uh, religious communities of the world, yeah. uh, <laughs> to give their devotion to the appearance. Look at that. It's like, um, again, we said it before, and you have two, Tom. It's e either it's a playbook or it's it's real, true, accurate prophecy. You know, it, it's very interesting. And, and again, just think about this tie-in. The, the comet here now that hit Russia three days ago, there's an asteroid uh, DA-14, you have uh, eyes on coming up a few, in a few days. What if this is the, uh, really is the, the precursor to, to something larger, uh, you know, comet-wise, asteroid-wise, actually coming in, the, the, the initial debris or something like that? It would be total mayhem, Tom, on this planet. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, back to part of the supernatural part of this, when we were investigating the um, prophecy of the popes, we learned that there was also a long line of other Roman Catholics who down through time saw Rome being destroyed after becoming an engine of the Antichrist. And I, and, but one thing that we turned up just recently that kind of ties a lot of this together, uh, trying to track down you know, where some of the modern writers in, in some of the material we're working on for the new book, Exo Vaticana, where they came up with this idea that, that Rome would be destroyed and it's going to be the great harlot, uh, and that somehow this is also connected to uh, either uh, a pretensive or actual um, announcement by the powers of the world that we are in contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And what in the world does that have to do with the coming of Petrus Romanus and the Vatican and all that? Well, we're trying to put all this together. And there was a team of like six of us. Me and Chris Putnam are writing the book. But I have a team of like six of us trying to track these people down. We, we actually got interviews, by the way, with leading astronomers, including Guy Consul Magno. Uh, we got five uh, interviews with him from Rome. So, so we got this right from the horse's mouth. And when we were trying to track down where some of this theology was coming from, we came across an associate of Pope John Paul II and also Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI. This was a friend of his. And he was considered one of the most uh, important Catholic theologians, Hans, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Now, he died in 1988. Uh, and at his funeral, Cardinal Ratzinger then, who became Pope Benedict, of course, uh, he praised his theology as correct and a proper roadmap for today's church. Well, what theology was he talking about? It was a it was a it was a provocative work by Hans von Balthasar called Casta Maritix or Chaste Harlot. Um, and and in this work he not only identified the Roman Catholic Church as the great harlot of Revelation, but he embraced it. And if <laughs> and if you read Chaste Harlot, it's astonishing. Let me just give you a fast quote. Sure, thanks. Here's what it says. 
The figure of the prostitute is so appropriate for the church that it defines the church of the new covenant in her most splendid mystery of salvation. The fact that the synagogue left the Holy Land to go and be among the pagans was an infidelity of Jerusalem. The fact that she opened her legs in every road in the world. But this same movement, which brings her to all the people, is the mission of the church. She must unite and merge herself with every people, and this new apostolic form of union cannot be avoided, in quote. So he, <laughs> he literally speaks in very brazen terms about how it is the responsibility of the church to spread its legs <laughs> to every nation of the world. <laughs> Astonishing. But, but, so, I mean, okay, so he's, you know... He's one of the most outlandish, uh, but we found that from this, it, boy, the tentacles of this kind of thinking uh, goes into a great deal of current theology, uh, and, uh, uh, and there's no way on this show that I can get into what all this means. Uh, I should have the first um, um, typeset. Uh, today, tomorrow, any time now, and if you'll send me your email, I'll send it to you so you can read this first type of this book. It's not going to be in print for probably a month. Uh, you, were, you are going to be astonished at what some of these theologians are now saying <laughs> and the way that all of this theology is married to the fulfillment of the prophecy of the popes, but also the coming of a new Catholic edict. You know, the pope can make a papal declaration. He can announce a new dogma that then... Uh, uh, becomes something that uh, the followers have to speak. He can speak, what do they call it, vicarious filae dei. He can speak as the voice of God uh, for the church, and they and he's um, he's infallible when he speaks in that role. And um, uh, su such is coming soon, and it's going to. I think it's going to just absolutely astonish people what this all means, but we've documented it. We've got documents. We've got the comments from the actual theologians that are working on this for the Vatican, uh, and we've got some of their own papers, uh, which I don't think they're yet ready for the world to know about, but they're going to know about it. Wow, really interesting. We're going to take a short break here, John. We're going to return and, and talk more in the second segment. Of course, we want to give out websites, RaidersNewsUpdate.com. You can get, catch a lot of the stuff that Tom has been talking about so far uh, there. But, of course, the, the book, Petra's Romanas, it's out. It's available right now. We're going to link that up. But uh, tell us just briefly a little bit about Exo Vaticana. When, when uh, do you expect it to have it out again, Tom? Well, we're rushing now. If you, if you go to, like, Amazon... Um, it and Petrus Romanus are both in the, the, the hot new releases, top le releases there. Um, and it's advertised there as being available uh, in April the 15th, but we're trying to get it out a month ahead of time. We're, we're trying very hard to get this done so that people will have it in hand uh, by the time the conclave meets and announces the new pope. All right, very interesting. We're going to link up uh, all, all the sources. Of course, you can check it out and keep your eye on that then. We're going to talk more about this when we return. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 